Alright, I guess we should probably get started. Hope everyone's doing well. Too many. Hello, 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 hello. Let's just turn this down a bit. Leave that. Hello, welcome, welcome. Welcome, everybody, to session number five. It has been a wild ride of various preparations and... <laughs> I think everything is all right today. The past few weeks have had technical issues mostly, uh, but yeah, we're back for another lesson and uh, I hope you all downloaded this project. Um, I had a lot of fun making it. I've been listening to a lot of like Aussie rap and drill and hip hop, a lot of, a lot of stuff and I thought it'd be fun to try and make something in that same style um, using just what Ableton has and can provide. Um, yeah, hopefully the audio is all good. You can hear me okay. Um, as always, just jump in the chat box if you want to know anything or if you need me to go over anything. But yeah, basically in this project, there is a bunch of things that I have shown you over the past few lessons. And also there are a few new things embedded and I'm going to pull them apart today. Um, yeah, so did everybody download this? I guess I should start with, did everyone download the uh, Ableton project and did it work for them? That's, I guess, number one, because otherwise, I don't know, it might be a little tricky. You might need to, yeah. I mean, you'll be able to follow, but obviously having the hands-on approach is much better. Hey everybody, hope you're doing well. Um, I've just opened up this project and I'm going to break it down. I guess I'll just start by saying um, there's a couple of things that, I don't know, I got a few messages earlier in the week about people who were a little bit confused about certain elements in Ableton and I thought I'd reiterate just in case you're feeling the same, uh, I don't know, you're having the same problems. Um, yeah, basically, I mean, the information that you're using on Ableton can be quite varied in that visually it would look different. Uh, for instance, these uh, clips here, you can't see how, by looking at this view, you can't see how long they are. However, if you hit tab and go to the um, arrangement view, you can see how long your tracks are. Uh, there was a bit of confusion from some people about that. I need to make that smaller. Why won't you go smaller? What's going on here? Maybe it's the top one. That's so weird. Oh, there we go. Get down. Yeah. So, basically, I put together this track. Um, I've recolored. So, basically, these are all the sections of the song. If you look at it horizontally, this is like the intro, and then this is kind of like the building up quite a bit more and then this red is where everything's kind of going and the song is running at full energy. Um, I like <laughs> matching the colors to like almost like an animated fire where you know the yellow is I guess 
the least hot. <laughs> As, and, and then it moves from yellow, orange, and red. And obviously when things are red, this is just what I do. Um, when things are red, that kind of means that it's full energy. It's everything's going. You've reached where you want to with the song. Um, these blue ones here, I was listening to the track and I wasn't quite sure if that sound really works. So... I've put it blue as a bit of a question mark and visually I can kind of tell that, you know, I'm not set on those, those parts. So we'll look into that, but, um, yeah, this is it. I guess I'll just turn it down a bit. So what I did was I made, these are all almost the same loops but a bit deconstructed as I brought them back, back down. Um, some of these are the same, even though the colors are different, like this and this is the same, but I've just visually, I visually made it different just so I can tell, you know, what part of the song I'm up to. And then later on when I'm in arrangement view, I can see that's where I want, you know, the most energetic, full-bodied part of the song to be. Um, when you're playing around with these, a handy little trick is you can actually assign each of these play buttons to, and anything, to a key on your keyboard. So if you go up to here and you click key, and you click on anywhere that is orange. Um, I think with the parts that move, you need like an up and down, but anything that's just a one click, you can, when you're in key mode, you can assign it. So I'm just gonna assign this going, going along the top of the keyboard there with QWERTY. So Q, W, E, R, T, and Y. Oh, and I'll go U. So just hitting that again. Now, if this is highlighted like that, you want to just untick that. And now you can just play the different parts as you go along, which is quite useful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play these through and I'm going to record them as I play them just to get a feel. It's like getting a live feel of the song. We're gonna record it into arrangement view and then we're gonna have a play around from there. So we'll just, let's just do it. I'm gonna hit stop. I'm gonna arm, arm things. And then I'm gonna just go ahead and hit Q. Now I'm going to run through the song. So using all those keyboard shortcuts, it's just a bit of fun. You don't really have to do that, but. Okay, so now onto W. A few more elements in there. Now I'm just doing this really quickly, going through all the parts. This is all recording in as we go. You can see it's all laying out there. And now I'm up to, what's it, four, three, four, five, okay. So 
So you can hear that the different uh, parts of the song are pretty similar. I'm gonna do something different and hit this one instead. Anyway, we pretty much have recorded in now. Let's hit tab. Oops. Tab. I'm gonna hit height and width. Cool, I'll just let this keep recording for a bit, but as you can see, all of the parts from session view have and I've, that have been recolored in this view are now in the composition. Okay, so that'll do. Now I'm gonna hit this button again because we know what that does. Now, so basically what I did was I got the sketch together and I recorded it onto the arrangement view. So, yeah, I started it a bit late, so I'm going to Command A, click and drag it back to the start. And yeah, there is our song. And now, because it's been color coded, you can really see where the different parts are, how the arrangement kind of works. So that's a nice way to, I guess, translate your session view into arrangement view. Now, what I've got in all of these views is I've got a percussion drum kit just from the drums section. I've got an 808 which is classic kind of rap trap drum machine which is main and then I've got the sprinkles which is just like those hot, fast hi-hats basically and Next channel, we've got that pad, which is going pre-fader. You'll notice that the fader's down, pre-fader's on, and the effect is being sent to A. And on A, I have a reverb, which is shooting into a phaser. So that's pretty straightforward. I've shown you about all those things. Uh, as I go through all of this, let me know if there's something that you've missed or if something you don't understand. So this p hard piano I found in the sounds, I was just digging around and maybe it was in piano and as you click on them, you can get a, you get a sample of what the synth sounds like. So yeah, went through and did that, got some Pan pipes one and this really cool one which is like deep sub bass haven't got the keyboard thing on so don't worry about that and this which is another synth which is just called percussive um, cool so let's break down some of these things we'll start with the musical elements now what I have added, I'm going to actually turn that on convenience. Um, what I've added is this thing here and this thing here. These are both very cool if you're not very good at playing music. If you don't know musical theory or chord theory, these things kind of do the work for you, which is really cool. So they're found in MIDI effects. So scale is basically this one and this one is chord. So chord is here, you've got a few choices. If you Google different chords for Ableton, you can get them and add them in. Um, but yeah, this is really handy. So I'm gonna go ahead and arm this and what it's doing is, it's playing chords because we have this here. These are all the different notes of the chord in minor Tim. <laughs> and a good thing before doing chords is having a scale. So I've dragged in the scale. It's very straightforward. I mean, if I unactivate that, disarm that, you can just hear it's one note 
as I play the keyboard and it's playing in F major so if you hit a note on, on your keyboard or if you've got a MIDI control and you play uh, it's going to move the note into that scale which is really awesome uh, really useful so hitting this one you get you can hear it's playing chords there are one two three four notes playing at the same time really nice to you know yeah get some chords going so that's exactly what I've done here so if you look at the mini information it's just one note one note one note one note and I've just played them in I've moved them a little bit and yeah so basically I have added this scale to each of the MIDI parts you can see here F major F major and F major they're all there and I've only done the chord on this kind of piano sound this one just to reiterate you're not seeing the level because I'm sending it pre-fader here to the reverb effect but yeah it is nice Mel yeah it's quite it's quite cool it's uh yeah it's helped me out in even learning how to understand musical theory because if you look at this so you've got F major it's going up three semitones up six semitones up ten semitones down two semitones so if you learn a scale um, you can follow that uh, to create cool chords um, anyway I don't think I need to no the, the chords are preset uh, now I believe you can so the chords are all here so this one I chucked in minor minor Tim so I guess it's just some kind of a minor chord uh, which is really really nice there's jazz for dummies and house four to go <laughs> But if you, yeah, like I was saying earlier, you can Google Ableton chord presets and you can get heaps more. Um, I'm not sure if, well, you can build them actually. If you know musical theory, you can, you can just chuck in chord and adjust the semitones to whatever scale. So basically with your keyboard or with a MIDI keyboard, it's if there is a note that's not in the scale and you go like C, uh, sorry, A and then S, and if S isn't in the scale, you're gonna hear the same note twice or it's gonna move up. So basically you'll notice when you're, if you have a scale setting, you can play and some of the keys will play the same note just because it's moving into the scale. Yeah, tweaking presets is, is very fun. And um, yeah, there's a bunch of things you can do. I might actually just get rid of that, get it back to how it was. Cool. Um, you could, I have, the, that's, um, tweaking the chords I've got a good idea for the second hour Mel I'll get into that later um, but for now yes that's scales and chords very very cool very easy and yeah I've added it to all these things okay so the next thing I wanted to show you was in this sound um, let's go over here so okay so this is the drum beat and um, 
is everyone all good on chords and scales? Just write down in the comments if you need to. Um, but yeah, so these are the next few things that we're gonna dive into. The compressor, which is very, very useful. A little bit hard to explain, but I've watched countless amounts of compressor explanation tutorials and I finally feel like I can not only understand what's going on, but explain it. Anyway, all right, so I've told you before about dragging effects onto channels. What you can actually do as well with your drum racks and drum machines and simplers and samplers that have multiple parts is you can give them all their own effect. So you're not limited to one effect per drum rack. You can actually, what I've done here on the snare is I've added this thing called an LFO, which we're about to get into, and auto filter. Now, if you look, the compressor effect is just this bar here. Everything to the right of that is on the entire channel. So just going back, if I choose this sound, I haven't affected it at all with effects, but the compressor is there. We've got this bar here separating the two. Now, what I have done with the snare, because I've noticed in, I guess, a lot of like rap and trap music, they use the 808 snare and they change the pitch of it. They change the, I guess in the samples case, they transpose it. Now, you can see that this one is just off doing its own thing. Let me see. That's because it's being controlled by this really, really cool feature. I'm so sorry, everyone who's using Ableton Live 9. This did not exist back then. It's quite new. Um, but I still feel like it's important to go over it for people using 10. So it's LFO. And if you remember last week, we went over the LFO feature, which was attached to certain effects. So this one, for instance, has an LFO. This is an LFO that is essentially assignable to any object that can be modified. So I have added it to the snare drum. Let's just quickly solo the snare and you can hear I've added an LFO that is like a kind of triangle looking wave that's running in time. So it's on the grid, it's running every one bar, it goes down like this. So you can hear on my sequence and you can see here the transpose is making the snare drum drop. Now, to get an LFO working is very, very simple. Basically, you just go over to Max for Live. Max for Live is very complex, um, but really, you know, you can just use this LFO. If you just open Max Audio Effect, you can just use this LFO on some of your parts and it just opens things right up. It's really spectacular. Um, so what I've done is I've just dragged in an LFO. Now this one is a different wave. So how I got that wave was just here. It's a sine wave and it's very straightforward. So the slower the rate, the bigger the wave. Yeah, this is quite a tech one, Penny, uh, but it is very useful, even using it in a very simple way. So essentially 
this wave right here can be assigned to any of the parameters. So for instance, or well, to activate it, you just click map, it'll start blinking like so. And you just, actually, I'll do it to this one. I'll do it to this, fade in. Look at that. Now this LFO is affecting the fade in. And what I've done on this side is I've changed the rate to be in time with the uh, master BPM. So that's what this little little note symbol kind of symbolizes. Now, this is basically just speed from really, really, really fast to really, really slow. Um, for this song, I was noticing <laughs> I'm glad your mind is blown. <laughs> um, I want to delete that off, so just click that. Um, yeah, basically this wave is being added to an element, putting it in time with this and basically just playing with it to taste. So that's kind of how I got Oh yes, so of course this fade in is. So basically this is the result of me just playing around with different waves. See, and then just finding, like there's also one that's random, which is really cool. But obviously it kind of sounds a little bit more experimental, I suppose. Uh, so that's where I kind of, that one goes up and I got, I ended up with got this snare that goes down every one bar and that works with the pattern. So this is something that, yeah, yeah we can assign to anything, to taste. Um, let's turn this one on. Let's add it to the frequency of the filter. Whoa, look at that. Slow down, buddy. So I'm basically just playing around with this. Now, the next, the next part of the LFO is, you'll notice this is going from top to bottom the whole way. We want to be a bit more subtle than that. So that's where we use depth. Depth essentially changes the range in which your LFO is operating. So you'll notice it's kind of in the middle. It's not moving as much. It's moving the same speed though. But this movement, we want to change this position where it's moving. So that's where offset comes in. So if we move offset, you'll notice we've pushed it up. So yeah, just the LFO, applying that to some of your effects can have really, really drastic results. It's making your, uh, yeah, your palette a lot more modular, you could say. Um, yeah, another really thing you can, I really <laughs> lost my words. Another really cool thing you can do is you can put an LFO onto an LFO. Now that's quite cool. So once you have two or three LFOs and then the final LFO modifying something, you can get very complex, very quick, but yeah. This is where I arrived at, and I'm gonna leave it there for now. So that's the LFO. I recommend applying that to all of your effects. Or maybe one or two. Is that pretty clear for everybody uh, watching at home? I might move on to the next thing now, if you're feeling good about it. 
I guess phase as well is basically just it's 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 changing where the LFO is kind of operating. It's another thing that you can just experiment experiment around with to taste. You'll find that most things on Ableton are used to taste. Just waiting out on the comments to see if everyone's all good and then I'll progress on to your new favorite effect, the compressor. Let's get that beat going back in while we hear what the compressor does. So you can hear that with that snare movement, it's quite subtle, but if you, if you take it off, you'll notice there's a quite drastic difference in feel. Yeah, I've just kind of, like I've uh, suggested in the past, just listened to a sound, listened to a genre and listened to a track and tried to recreate it. And that's what I've done here. And that's what I encourage you to do if you're feeling a bit daunted by where to start. Just have a few exercises in trying to recreate some of your favorite songs. Um, you don't have to do anything with it. It's just a good exercise to learn what you're doing and yeah, develop. I think my music is definitely, you know, me trying to recreate sounds that I really love, multiple genres and kind of meshing them together. And I think that's where a person's kind of unique sound comes from is all of their influences, you know, and how they use them because it's a bit silly to say that you can make music that doesn't have some kind of reference into, you know, the lineage of music, electronic music. Uh, I think that's what's really interesting about electronic music is the way that it kind of is very cyclic, but yeah, each kind of wave of people interprets it or, you know, takes it in a different way, but it is very cyclic, but yeah. Anyway, I'm assuming you're all good. So I'm going to move on to the compressor. So what the compressor does, let's see how to explain this in the most simple way. All right. What the compressor does is it takes the loudest point of a track and brings it down. So it kind of, here I am saying that I'd be able to explain it perfectly, but the mystery of the compressor is, uh, yeah, pretty wild. So essentially what it's doing is you've got a threshold here and any audio file that goes beyond the threshold that you set will be brought down to that level. So essentially what you're doing is you're squashing the higher sounds down, making your audio track more equal. So what that does in turn is makes things more punchy. So I've put it onto my drum rack and what it's done is it's taken the loud kicks and the loud snares and it's brought them down to make a more even sound. Now it obviously gets a little bit more complex than that, but that's the very basic premise of the compressor. It's ha it's, it has a threshold. Anything that goes beyond the threshold 
is reduced down to that same level as you can see here. This is what's the gain reduction. This is what's been taken down. And then you have the output. Now, in squashing your sound down, you might lose volume, but your sound is going to be more even. So what you can do is you can bring it up. But right now mine's clipping in at zero and I don't really want to push it any higher, but some things you'll notice there's a drop in audio. You just need to bring that level up and you're going to have a sound that is more even, more punchy is the, uh, you know, is the main reason why you'd use a compressor to get things sticking out in the mix, you know. If you want a vocal to stick out in your track, you'd use a compressor on it. Compressors are generally used in most vocal tracks to even them out, you know, people sing soft and loud and, or they can, and a compressor can help bring all that up to the one level. So I hope I explained that okay, but yeah, that's basically it. The attack and the release are how fast this action of gain reduction happens. So if you have a long attack, it will take a long time. So attack is basically something that goes from zero to a hundred and it's dictating the time in which it takes to get from zero to a hundred. I've brought up attack and release in the past. Release is the same thing, except for it's the fall off of the audio file. It's how long it takes to go down to nothing. Now you have all these different features for uh, compressor. I don't think I need to get too much more complex than that. I think what you should do is, is just play around with the compressor and you'll notice when you play around with the threshold, bringing that right down, you'll notice that certain frequencies, you know, let's do it. Let's bring it right down you'll notice that the kick drum, the subby kick drum is almost completely gone there. Adam Hipwell, thanks for the follow. Thank you F42UM Music for the follow and Special T, big ups, big ups. I'm just going through the compressor at the moment. So yeah, what I've done is I've got it at a spot which is just catching a lot of those higher points. Um, how is everyone feeling about compressors? Jump into the comments and let me know. But yeah, generally, I mean, with my music, I use compressors for a bunch of things. A lot of the time, my drums have compressors. You might find that you're gonna use a compressor as much as you're gonna use EQ to sculpt sound. But yes, so just for this, you can hear the difference. It almost sounds more fl more uh, flat without the compressor. Ah, uh, hello, unpin. Um, I will open up that link in a sec, which is probably something that I've seen before which is like unpacking what a compressor can do and applications of, of the compressor. Thank you. Once again, coming through. Big, big love. All right, let's continue, shall we? You'll notice playing around with that, so we have to activate it again on the timeline. Oh, don't need that to be so big. So we have our track. 
Let's have a listen to pan pipes and see if we want that melody in there. Just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm interested in your opinion. Let's unloop it, hopefully in time. It's a bit basic. gone through chords, we've gone through scales, we've gone through compressor, we've used LFO, we've used pre-fader like last week, effects. Now we've recolored these to kind of give us a visual representation of the song's structure, which is really useful. And I don't like that, so we're going to get rid of that. Let's see. Cool. All right. Um, I'm trying to think. Some uh, some drum racks have built-in compressors and different effects. That there we go. There's a compressor there. This is a very, very basic compressor. Also very, very basic echo. Yes, is there any questions about anything that we have covered today? Otherwise I might show you the fun I've had with AutoPan to create, not panning, but an audio effect. I'll just give it a minute to see if there is anything anyone would like to know. Oh, this song plays. I think for the second hour, we're going to play around with mixing up the patterns like last week and just creating something that has a bit more of a nice flow. Ah, there was one other thing that I wanted to cover, and we will in just a moment. I think everyone's all good, it seems like, so we'll just push forward. Um, all right, so if we go back into what did I have for lunch? I just had some leftovers. It was not very exciting. Um, all I eat is leftovers. I just cook one giant meal and then just eat it for breakfast, lunch and dinner. I'm so sick of food. <laughs> Moving on. Okay, so last week we looked into automation. Automation can also happen in your drum racks and MIDI racks. So the same principle applies where if you click something, it kind of activates it in automation mode. But what we need to do is we need to click down here and get into automation mode within our sequence. So basically I have this sequence selected. Now automation is going to be affected only on that one. So it's the same as up here, except with the main menu and then the sub menu, but it's over here. So each individual sound has a whole lot of automation that can happen, but it can be quite confusing. So to find something that we want to change, we're going to go to a sound. So maybe clap so the clap we might want to change it to one shot mode and we want to transpose it so actually yeah we'll do transpose it's audibly obvious so I've clicked it it's got the little markers around the edge I'm gonna go back to this mode and now 
this bar is our automation bar within our sequence. So it's basically exactly the same thing as the automation up in arrangement view. It's going to minimize that except for it's yeah it's just contained you don't see it anywhere oh actually it is there but it's much easier to work work on it here so what i'm going to do is i'm going to transpose the snare so each second one goes down one semitone you can hear it but it's not So that's a really nice way to mix up your uh, sequence without being too obvious, but you can also be very obvious and very crass with that effect, but that's just internal sequence automation, which is a very useful, useful thing. That will only be applied to sequence that you have modified. Now I believe what you can also do is highlight it. So I'll just finish this off actually. So feel to it. So if we want to copy that, we can just highlight it, Command C, and I'm going to click this sequence. We're still in transpose mode, which is fantastic. We're going to... Yes, that's right, Vicky. So the automation activating it down here, basically uh, MIDI sequences can have their own individual automation. So that's what I've done there is I've activated it. I've activated this one, which is only the orange one. And I've done the automation by selecting the thing that I want to automate, which was the claps trans transpose, which is that. And I've gone back into the sequence and it will come up and you can modify it. And so what I'm gonna do now is I wanna highlight all that and copy it onto all the sequences. So this one, I've already done it. I've Command C, Command V. This one, pop it in. This one, pop it in. No worries, all good. Um, yeah, that's kind of bringing us into the end of the more formal hour. So just to reiterate again, we've created, well, I've created this sketch of a song and I've recolored each section in a way that I know, you know, the flow of, how the flow is going to work. So you could do this in any way you want really. But I find that the yellow, orange, red is really, yeah, it's for me, it's something that I'm visually used to. Anyway, but yeah, so we've recolored. I'm just gonna make them a different color because I'm pretty sure, yeah. So what you record in is what's gonna stay there. So you'll notice that the colors are interchangeable. Once you record something in, it's going to stay like that. You can also highlight everything, Command C it, 
and Command V it in. If you've made changes and you want to alternate between arrangement view and sequence view, you just got to remember everything you change in arrangement view is it's kind of locking down. It's just not going to match what's in this view. So we played our song and we've got a composition. We did that by playing and recording the sketches. We've been arranging a bit. We've learned about chords and scales, which can be applied only to MIDI effects. Um, if you're a little bit more advanced and you have MIDI output going to external synthesizers, etc., that MIDI information will also work. So this is all really useful, you know, if later on down the track you want to buy a little desktop synthesizer or something or have a synthesizer, this stuff um, applies. So yeah, we got scales, chords, we've just put them on our MIDI channels only and we've played around with them. Forgot to get into this, but I'll get into that in a sec. Um, we have learnt about the LFO and ways to click and assign it to whatever we want. Uh, using multiple is really excellent. And we have learnt about the compressor and the way in which it brings down the louder sounds, squashes them down, essentially making our audio more equal and in turn more punchy. And we also learnt about automation within sequences, which is down here. We can turn that on and off. And I'm trying to think, I don't think I've missed anything else, but yeah. What I'm gonna do for the second hour is I'm just going to try and make this song better. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to show you auto pan, which is a really cool effect, which can make an audio sound, you know, go to left to right or swirl around. But in this case, I've actually used it to affect the way the audio sounds. So let's solo this. Now you can hear, just turning it up, turning out the master so you can hear it a bit better. And I'll loop that so it just keeps going. Now, if I turn off auto pan, you'll notice it's just a pretty basic sound. But what the auto pan is doing is similar to that snare that I put the LFO on, it's using a triangular wave to essentially create like a pulsing kind of sound. Now to do that, I've just changed the phase. So it's either 360 or zero. And I've changed, when you open up an auto pan, it's going to be a sine wave by default. But yeah, if you have stereo headphones, it should be going side to side. Uh, I think Twitch can be a bit funny with stereo, but you'll be able to hear it in your own headphones with the uh, project. But that is also a really cool way to treat sound, uh, turning something that sounds kind of boring into something that has a bit of a nice pulse and movement. Actually sounded quite good before. That's got a bit of a more stranger kind of. That's nice. Look at that. Apply to taste. Anyway. Now, uh, before I go into the second hour, I just want to say when you're working on music, and I might have said this before, um, 
Yeah, it's a cool discovery. Um, I might have said this before, but when you're working on music, try and not look visually at what you're listening to because you'll find that you you kind of you'll know what's coming up you'll know what to expect and it will affect the way you listen to the song that you're working on so i recommend if you're listening to like a sequence like this just hit play and like have some time maybe just like get a a nice picture picture up or something you know like to look away from what you're working on because visually sometimes it can dictate what you're doing and and yeah that can have often I guess a negative effect maybe it makes you it could make your music a little bit more uh, predictable Um, but yeah experiment with not looking at the music that you're working on obviously you can't do that a great deal because when you're editing and you know making fine adjustments but you know if you've done a lot of work and you want to just sit back and have a listen try and listen not not viewing the uh arrangement i think can be really good and you can get a feel for your track and how it should naturally progress yeah definitely definitely just like djing um that brings us into